North Sea flood kills 1,836 people. The Korean War ends. The year is 1953. And this was Packard's all-new offering, the Caribbean. But before getting into all of it, I'm Jay. Welcome to What It's Like, the automotive channel that talks about the history, design of these rolling works of art. We cover the classics, vintage, some exotics, lots of orphan cars, and cars that are frankly being forgotten. If that sounds like an automotive channel that you will totally dig, subscribe and hit the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. We do a lot of cars that are for sale on this channel. This car isn't for sale. Let's talk 1953 Packard model lineup. You had the Cavalier, followed by the Patrician, followed by the Mayfair, Clipper, and then all new for 1953 was the Caribbean. Packard in the late 40s, early 50s was far fall from the Packard of the 20s and the 30s. In a lot of ways, they sort of lost their way after World War II. Some would say they had a stodgy, old-fashioned appearance. Packard needed a breakthrough halo car. Enter the Caribbean. Based on the Cavalier convertible, but built on the Clipper platform with custom touches. And, I'm using air quotes, this was Packard's sports car. Packard would offer the Caribbean from 1953 through 1956. And it would take the place of the Packard Super 8. The Caribbean would not be replaced. The Caribbean was, in a lot of ways, Packard's swan song. And Caribbean could be said two different ways. It's like tomato and tomato, or potato or potato. I actually say Caribbean. But for whatever reason, I was saying Caribbean, so I'm going for it. But it might change to Caribbean as we go on. The Packard Caribbean was inspired by the Pan American show car that was unveiled at the 1952 New York Auto Show. It was essentially a customized 1951 Packard 250 convertible that was built by Henny Motor Company, which was the maker of Packard ambulances, hearses, and other special body type conversion vehicles. Henny did other cars besides Packard, but Packard was the brand that they more or less went with. Styling was credited to Richard Arbid, who was an employee at Henny at the time, who worked under Dick Teague's guidance. What sets the Packard Caribbean apart from the other Packards was the hand-formed rear quarter panels, fully rounded wheel openings, Continental kit, chrome wire wheels, higher quality of interior materials. 1953 was the very first year for the Packard Caribbean. It was only offered for four years. It did get a totally different redesign in 1955. So let's compare 53 on the top, 55 on the bottom. And I think it's cool to see where the design went. I'll be the very first person to say that early 50s isn't my favorite era of Packard, but this isn't your typical early 50s Packard. The big giveaway is the scoop in the front. Most of the other Packards, actually all of the other Packards besides the uh, Caribbean, they didn't have a hood scoop. In 53, looking at both of these from the front, look at the 53. The 53 looks way more formal, more reserved. The 55 is aggressive in your face. It's like the banker's hot rod. Look at how curvy the 53 looks in comparison to the 55. Looking at the side profile, the 53 is a single color, whereas the 55 is tricolored. Look at how round the wheel wells are on the 53 versus the 55. Wrap around windshield on the 55. Vent windows are a different design and different shape. Gas filler cap is in about the same place. Looking at the rear, what an awesome rear on both of those. Just wait until we do the walk around on the 53. Moving to the dash and interior, which one do you like better? The 53 is definitely growing on me, but I will say this, 53 and 54 power output was 180 horsepower. 55 power almost went up by 100 horsepower, courtesy to Packard's V8, 275 horsepower in 1955. In 56, it even got better with 310 horsepower. Coach work was done by Mitchell Bentley in Michigan. Let's talk specs. 213 inches long, 78 inches wide, 62 inches tall. It rides a wheelbase of 122 inches. It weighs 4,105 pounds. Price, 
$5,215, which is equivalent to you spending $59,401.58 in the year 2023. Total 1953 Packard production across all of the lines was 90,252 units. Total Caribbean was 750 units. It's worth mentioning the 54 is rarer. They only made 400 of them in 54, somewhere around there. Moving on to engines. Only one engine on offer, 327 cubic inch displacement flathead in line 8. 5.4 liters. It's good for 180 horsepower at 4,000 RPM, 300 pound-feet of torque at 2,000 RPM. With a bore of 3.5 inches and a stroke of 4.3 inches, compression is 8 to 1. When backed with a 3-speed manual transmission, 0 to 60 could be had in 11.9 seconds. Theoretical top speed, 98 miles per hour. It's hard to believe that this won't go faster than 100 um, in the comment section below, if you had one of these, what is the fastest that you've had it up to? Average fuel consumption is anywhere between 12 and 15 miles to the gallon. And these are all baseline numbers. You could get more, you could get less. This is just average. Packard offered three transmissions, three speed manual, three speed manual with optional overdrive, or the Ultramatic, which was their automatic transmission offering. It was a two-speed design with a lock-up torque converter. The early versions of the Ultramatic were normally operated only in high, with low having to be selected manually. This changed in 1954, so if you get a 53, that is generally how it is. 1953 Packard Caribbean came in four different colors. Polaris Blue, Golf Green, Matador Maroon, Sahara Sand. Let's talk styling. Just look at how this is separate from this. If you're new to the channel, teal is my favorite color and it just, teal looks so great with stainless. Such a great contrasting color. Get the different levels in this bumper. Bumper rats. These almost look like miniature Dagmars. They're not quite Dagmars. They don't protrude out far enough for that. Fog lights. Headlights. Look at the bezel around the headlights. Just look at all of the different lines sculpted into this nose of this car. Hood scoop looks to be functional. All this textured effect here. The attention to detail is just great. Coming up here, there is an ever so slight crease coming down to this headlight bezel. Just look at all the lines in the hood, how this comes down. I was never a huge fan of these. My friend had one when we were growing up, not one with a hood scoop, but this one just looks top notch. Look at the stainless fender molding, how it's flared, the nice wire wheels. The mirrors are mounted here on the side. Take a look at this windshield, how it's designed. It's got the suicide wipers. Look at how this comes. that bulge fender bulge and it's so discreet you can almost not see it you'd see it better on the other side let's go to the other side because uh, the light is hitting it differently over there so see what I mean it's ever so subtle like on the other side you could barely see it but on this side because light is hitting it it's more pronounced just look how clean the sides are. It's almost like pontoon style. And then it has these fins. This almost looks like something Pontiac would do. How it comes down into the lights. The bumpers. Look at how they're layered. All of this. It's got Continental kit in the back. Smooth trunk lid. 
The window back here is plexiglass, but just look at the top. I don't think that there's a better combination than teal and white. White and teal is just a really classy, very dapper look. And these cars aren't really teal, they're almost like a seafoam green. It'd probably be a better color. Coming to the door handle, just look at how it's designed. This door has some heft to it. Just look at all of the stainless up on top. White contrasting color right below it. Teal and or seafoam green. It's more of a seafoam green than a teal. Pull the door shut with this or armrest. Door handle to get out. This one has power windows. And they operate like that. Just look, it has this nice channel. So the front one controls the front window. And this one's for the passenger side. Weirdly, you can't control the rear windows from this driver's seat. Interesting. Down here, inside the pedal box, high beam switch, brake pedal, gas pedal. This is to engage the convertible top, hand brake. Just take a look at this interior. Here is what over the hood looks like. Here is what first person over the hood looks like. Notice it's a totally clean over the hood profile. Unlike Packard, there isn't a hood ornament out there to look over. In the hood scoop, you can't even tell it's there. Below the steering wheel, there's adequate space between my hand and my lap. And the only reason I show this is because if you're the same size as me, I wear size 36 pants. And if you're the same size as me, you'll fit in this car perfect. It's not comfortable driving with the steering wheel in your lap. On to the button switches and knobs. Three pods sit directly in front of the driver. In the first pod is the gas gauge at the top, coolant temperature at the bottom, oil pressure, amp meter, are idiot lights. Speedometer with odometer and tripometer inside of it, flanked by turn signals. Clock, key is all the way to the left. Headlights, antenna, lighter, heat and ventilation controls, radio, drive modes, read, park, neutral, high, low, reverse. Above, there are sun visors, and they're a bit on the slender side. And just look at how they're operated. Look at these hinges. That's different. Con convertible top mechanism is right there. Another sun visor there. Daytime, nighttime, rear view mirror in the center. Coming to the rear seat, just push the seat forward like that and it pivots out of the way. That is how much space you have to get back there. This is what the front looks like from the back. Let's take a quick gander at the greenhouse or the pillar to glass ratio. It's very airy in this car. This is what visibility looks out the rear from the back seat. That is a really nice view of those fins. I would have never guessed that that was a good angle for the, you know, those fins look great. Behind it, the seat, there's a nice storage place to put stuff when the convertible top is in use. There is a light switch for a light. Here is an ashtray. This car doesn't have a center armrest. The seats are very interesting. The back slopes down quite a bit back here. It's almost like sitting on one of those um, auditorium seats. Remember when you were a kid and you tried to like push your seat back? It's kind of like that, but it, it's comfortable because it, in a weird way, it's just comfortable. Here's my knee situation. I had tons of room. It's very comfortable back here. And that, that's why. Look, look at that. I never saw that before. So this car's got power windows in the front and it's got manual windows in the back. And they operate like this. So just like that. I never saw that. I've seen it that you could order it like that, but I've never seen a car where it had power windows in the front, manuals in the back.
This is what I look like sitting in the rear seat. I've got tons of headroom. It's actually very spacious back here. This would make for a very quaint family car. If you're looking at getting a classic car that will haul around the family, if you have bigger kids like teenagers, they fit back here perfect. Let's take a real quick gander under the hood. I apologize that this is a picture. I couldn't figure out how to open the hood on this. Some of them are puzzling. This one was hard. Straight eight under the hood. Notice six volt battery off to the side there, but it's under the hood. Sometimes cars during this era had the batteries in the floorboard. On the positive side, if you bought one of these 10 years ago, hell, even like five or two, maybe two and a half years ago, prices jumped, like catastrophically jumped in the last few years. These are very, very nice cars. Super plushy seats, real leather, very high quality materials. You don't ever see these that often. And when you do, you almost take a double take because it doesn't look like a, it looks like a 53 Packard that's been customized by a professional customized person, say like Chip uh, Foos or somebody like that. Against it, some trim parts are impossible to find. Prices have skyrocketed. I'm talking like $200,000 for a number one car. And a number one car is a perfect Concords car, flawless. The Ultramatic Automatic can be tricky to get working right. All right, now it's time for Would You Rather two scenarios today. In the first scenario, would you rather have 1953 Cadillac Eldorado convertible or 1953 Packard Caribbean convertible or 1953 Lincoln convertible? I'm going to leave this here for a minute. If you need more time, feel free, pause the video. Moving to the second scenario, and these models, they weren't really competitors, but these other two cars were wicked expensive in 1953, so I figured, why not? 1953 Buick Skylark Convertible, or 1953 Packard Caribbean, or 1953 Oldsmobile 98 Fiesta. Once again, gonna leave this here for a minute. If you need more time, feel free, pause the video. First person to give the name of the band and the song title correctly in the comment section below will have their comment pinned to the top of it. Thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. If you'd like to get in touch with me, shoot me a comment in the comment section below or check out our Facebook group that correlates with this YouTube channel. If you don't have Facebook and would like to reach me, send me an email. All of that will be linked in the description below. Just know I appreciate all of the support. And until next time, toodaloo! This is going to be code for any car that I would buy. I'm going to sing 16 Candles at the end. And I would totally buy this if I had the money. You're only 16, but you're my teenage queen, oh my queen.